Hear the word of the Lord. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made my covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to invite you to continue to think through the words we just sang in worship and think about what has the amazing love of Jesus done for you. We just sang, I'm alive, your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. And so let's just spend a moment just between you and the Lord. Let's thank him for the amazing love that he's shown you in your life. Just tell that to him just in the quietness of this moment between you and him. Jesus, to have life, to be able to have a life that is abundant in this life and a life, a hope of eternal life in the future because, Jesus, you died and rose again. That is the gospel, and we live with the preciousness of that gospel every single day. Lord, help us to reflect well, to worship well, as we think about the love that Jesus, you showed to us. Now, as we turn our hearts to your word, as we seek to learn from you, to hear from the Jesus who loves us, speak to us through your word. Lord, help us to listen well. Help us to learn well, and Lord, would you bring life transformation in us because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. It is a good morning. It's a good day to come together to worship, and uh, it's one of those things, I hope you feel this when you come in on Sundays. Um, I need this this morning. Uh, I didn't have a bad week. It was a, it was a busy week, but it wasn't a bad week. But uh, the culmination of being able to worship with you all, brothers and sisters in Christ, is uh, we need this. And it helps us to be able to live our faith out the rest of this week. And so I hope that you come in this morning, even if you're still waking up a little bit, uh, with joy and excitement in your heart for what the Lord is doing. Well, in 2021, uh, my family took a vacation to Texas and uh, one of the first things that we wanted to do there, one of the first things on the list, was to go to the uh, Six Flags Over Texas Amusement Park in Arlington. That's just west of, of Dallas. And so we had uh, bought our tickets online months before. We had watched all the videos of the roller coasters. You know, they have those like firsthand uh, person in the seat videos so you can see how much Dramamine you're going to need to take before you get on the, on the roller coaster. And, uh, and we had planned out all of our other activities that we were going to do that day uh, around spending the, the day at the park, clearing uh, any obstacles that we could think of um, that would keep us from going to Six Flags, because that was the most important, most uh, precious thing about that day. There was, however, an obstacle that we couldn't control. And that was Six Flags' policy that they would close the park if there was a dangerous lightning or, or thunderstorm. Well, that was in the forecast, but we're from Oregon, right? And so for us, it's like, you know, a thunderstorm, it rolls in, it barks a little bit, it rains a little bit, and then it goes away, and then you go back to life, right? That's just kind of how we expected it. And so that morning, when the, the dark clouds started coming in and the showers began, we thought, no problem, typical day in Oregon. It'll start raining a little bit, Thunder, it'll stop, park will open, even if it closes, we'll be fine. And then it started. Raindrops the size of marbles started falling down on us. Lightning uh, in the sky filled the sky. It looked like, you know those electric plasma balls that you have where you touch it and it looks like the electricity is going to bite you? Like that's what the sky looked like. 
And then the sound of the thunder and lightning, it was like someone had given a, a kid cymbals and said, hit this as hard as you can and just keep going. That's what this kind of this whole experience felt like on that morning. And so as, as we pulled into the, the near empty parking lot at Six Flags, uh, I got out of the car to walk to the gate knowing that I was risking my life for my family. And I got the obvious bad news that the park was closed due to dangerous weather. That was this obstacle. We, we had planned to be at the park all day. Like this was what we were doing that day. We, we looked forward to, to this for months. We had cleared every obstacle that we could see to get there and to do this. But there was still an obstacle in the way of our family experiencing the joys and the thrills that Six Flags Over Texas had to offer. And so to this day, I've never been to Six Flags Over Texas. Now, in light of eternity, uh, an obstacle in the way of our spending the day at an amusement park is pretty insignificant, and we actually ended up going to a different Six Flags down in San, San Antonio later in the week. But, but what if we were talking about something more significant? What if we were talking about something being an obstacle to the gospel? What if we were talking about something or someone getting in the way of another person experiencing the joy and the thrills of the good news about Jesus? What if we were that obstacle? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul continues the case that he started in chapter 8 about loving one another and showing deference to one another. And he makes the argument in this chapter that it is possible for us to actually be an obstacle to the gospel. It is possible for people in the church who have all been called to proclaim the gospel in some way to actually get in the way of the gospel. And the way that we do that is by making our rights and our preferences more precious to us than making a way for people to hear and understand the truth about Jesus. And the way that we avoid doing that is by being willing to sacrifice those rights so that people might be saved and grow in Christ. It is seeing the gospel as more precious than our rights. That's the solution. What does that mean? How do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. So turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Last week we were in chapter 8. We're moving into chapter 9. And in chapter 8, we learned from Paul that, that out of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to take care that we don't destroy another's faith in the church uh, and the use of our freedoms and our knowledge and our rights as Christians. Uh, Just because we think something is okay for us to participate in and our doing something is fine and we have freedom to do that, uh, if it will cause a brother or sister to stumble in their faith, uh, we must at least be willing to sacrifice our rights to not be a stumbling block to them. And at the end of the passage in chapter 8, Paul had personalized this to himself. So look at chapter 8, look at the end of the chapter, verse 13. He said, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. So so Paul had closed this chapter on this topic by applying this to his own life, to his own practice of this. Well, as we come to chapter 9, Paul's going to even further apply this principle to himself by using his own life and his own ministry as an example of how he has already sacrificed his own rights for the sake of the Corinthians' faith and for the sake of the gospel. And to show how he sacrificed those rights, the first thing that he does is to establish that he indeed has rights of the, as, as an apostle of Jesus that he has not claimed from the Corinthian church. And that leads us to point number one this morning. There is a rightful claim to rights as a sower of the gospel. As a person who plants seeds of the gospel, as a sower of the gospel, there is a rightful claim to some rights. That's his first point. That's where he's going to start. And and you'll notice that the way he begins this in verses one through six, Paul comes across as very defensive, Uh, It appears that the reason for that is that there's some in the church who are challenging his ministry 
perhaps thinking or accusing him of being in this ministry, in this gospel proclamation ministry, for his own personal gain or his own personal benefit. And so look at verse 1. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are my seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord at Cephas or Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Stop there for just a minute. and got to know that one of the requirements for a person to be considered an apostle of Jesus was that they had to have seen Jesus alive. And so Paul claims that in verse 1. He says, yes, I've seen him. And we have the account of that in Acts chapter 9. And then in verse 2, he says, there is evidence of his apostleship because he says, they as the Corinthian church, they themselves are the seal of his apostleship. Their salvation, their experience as a church is proof of his legitimacy as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So, so he's legitimately an apostle, and along with being an apostle of Jesus, came certain rights that he could claim. There were certain rights, certain authorities that he could go to as an apostle that he could exercise those authorities. Namely, the ability to expect support financially and materialistically from the churches to whom he ministered, and not just for him, but for him and any family that he might have had. That's why in verse 4, look at verse 4, he mentions this right to eat and drink. And then in verse 5, should he have wanted to have one, the right to have a believing wife with him as the other apostles and the brothers of Jesus and, and Peter did. He says, as an apostle, a worker for Christ, he has a rightful claim for those rights, those places where he could exert his authority and expect that the church would provide for his needs. Now, we know from the previous chapters that we've been in this book that Paul was single. We know that he wasn't married, and so he didn't have a wife for the church to care for. And we know that Acts chapter 18, verse 3 that Paul actually had another job, right? He was a tent maker. So he had a trade that he was involved in. And so he had finances that were coming in from that to help support him. So, so even though Paul hasn't demanded those rights from the Corinthians because he doesn't have a wife and he doesn't have a, and he's got another job, he's making the case in verses one through six that nevertheless, he could have done that. He could have demanded those rights. And then in verse seven, he moves to offering three illustrations from everyday life to argue why it would be normal for him to expect their support. And then that's followed in, by an argument in verse 8 from the Old Testament to further reinforce the case. So look at verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? So you talk about the Old Testament now. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? And so Paul uses these three illustrations to show that, that it's expected that he would ask for some kind of support. He uses the example of a soldier in an army, a person who plants a vineyard, a shepherd of a flock. All three of those illustrations make the point that it is right for a worker to benefit from his labors. Then he turns to a passage of the Old Testament to anchor that not simply in common sense, but in biblical instruction. Uh, if you remember in the Old Testament, oxen were often used on the threshing floor to, to walk over or to, to tread over stalks of grain, and that would result in the heads of the, the grain cracking, and then all of the, the um, seeds would fall to the ground, and then that would be easier for them to harvest and to sell the, the grain. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, Moses had written verse 4, not to muzzle the ox while it was doing that, but to let it eat a portion of what it was helping to produce because it would be cruel to deprive the oxen of the produce of his work. 
And so here, Paul uses that same principle to say in verse 11, like a soldier, like a shepherd, like a planter, like an ox, like a sower, I worked among you and I've sown spiritual things among you. I have sown the gospel among you. Should I not have the right to reap that material benefit from what I've sown? You sow and reap. Should I not be able to reap what I've sown? It's like on Thursday, Ruthanne and I went to the, to the store to get some, some starter vegetable plants. Have you guys done that so far already? Like it's getting to that place where you're supposed to plant and all that. So, so we did that, and we want to plant it in our garden boxes, put it in the ground, and, and now, you know, you wait for the weather and all that kind of stuff to, to make it grow. And, and what is the expectation that we're going to have of what we're going to do with that once it happens? We're going to get food, right? We're going to get vegetables. We're going to get fruit because we planted it in order to reap what we've sown. Well, that's the point that Paul's making here. Those who work and sow in the gospel should have the right to reap a material benefit from their work in the gospel. And to solidify that point even further, he then adds in verse 13, look at this. Do you not know that those who are employed in temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. When he says there in verse 14 that the Lord commanded, he's probably referencing back to Luke chapter 10, verse 7, where Jesus had said that a laborer deserves his wages. And Paul's main point in all of this is this. There is a rightful claim to to certain rights, namely to reap material compensation to be paid to a person or as a person whose work is in the sowing of the gospel. That's his main point. All right, so what? Right? What's the whole point of this? Why is it a big deal that there is a rightful claim to that? Well, we're going to get to that in terms of the context of the whole chapter in just a minute. But I think the closest application of this principle so far is our practice of financially compensating pastors and missionaries and ministry leaders who work as staff for churches and ministry organizations in places that exist to proclaim the gospel. We do that based on the same biblical principles that Paul uses here, where he says those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And practically speaking, one of the things that happens by that is it frees people in those ministries to stay focused on on the ministry and not have to go and find other tent-making jobs that would take them potentially away from that ministry. Now, that does happen. Uh, we do have people who serve in bivocational ministry where people split their time between working at the church or a ministry job and then another job elsewhere in order to pay the bills. Uh, but we can be confident from Scripture that it is not wrong and there is biblical instruction and precedent for, for compensating those who serve in sowing for the gospel. Now, now, let me just speak to the elephant in the room for just a minute. I'm not trying to defend my job, Okay. What I hope you're getting from this is we can be comfortable that the model we use as church, where we do compensate people for ministry roles, that's actually biblical. It's not going against the scriptures. Now, we do that while at the same time, we must be very careful of, of Paul's warning to us, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, not to appoint into ministry those who are lovers of money. People who, who, you know, they abuse this right. They see church work and ministry work as just an opportunity to make money off of the church uh, rather than seeing it as an opportunity to serve in the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, So this is this whole idea of financially and materialistic supporting people in vocational ministry. That's probably the closest application that we can glean from this passage so far. But here's what I want you to keep in mind. Here's what's really important for all of us as we're looking at this text. Paul is making this claim in chapter 9 as an example of the principle that he already uh, argued in chapter 8, which was, which was that as followers of Jesus Christ, we all have freedoms and rights in Christ. Every one of us has rights and freedoms in areas where the Lord has delegated to us the freedom to make decisions. We talked about this last week. We all have, as believers, certain areas where God has given us freedom to follow our consciences in making decisions 
in exercising authority in our lives and sometimes exercising authority in the lives of other people that have been put under our delegation or our leadership. We have rightful claims to those rights. Where the Bible doesn't clearly say something is sinful, where where there is freedom for us, we have the ability to make decisions to follow our biblically informed consciences. What we eat or drink, which activities we participate in, which theological efforts or political efforts that we advocate for. We have rights and freedom as believers to make those decisions according to our own consciences. But as Paul continues here, he says that there is a time where it is better not to claim those rights. And that leads us to point number two this morning. The reason for not claiming rights is the spread of the gospel. There will come times where you will not claim those rights because you want to see the gospel spread. Look at the second part of verse 12. He says, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure such a provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So here Paul says he hasn't claimed the rights that he could claim from them, namely asking them for compensation and provision and material things, because in verse 12, he doesn't want any of that to be an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Now, we don't know exactly why or how in this context it would have caused an obstacle to the gospel, but it may have been because traveling preachers during those days were known for trying to impress people with their messages and impress people with their deliveries. And the more lucrative you could, uh, the more lucrative the career was based on how amazing and impressive your message or your speech was. And we certainly see that happening in, in the church today, right? We see that happening with TV evangelists. We see that happening with traveling preachers. It can be quite a lucrative career. So Paul may be wanting to completely separate himself from the reputation of that kind of preacher who is open to accusations of simply being in this whole thing in order to make a buck off of the church. But the other reason that he isn't claiming his rights or requiring pay for preaching them the gospel is that it gives him an, an ability to boast that they can hear the gospel free of charge. He says in verses 16 and 17 that he's been called to preach. And, and so for him, preaching is simply being faithful to the task that he's been stewarded with. He's just doing his job. There's no boast in that. But when he can preach and not be paid for it, He says in verse 15, he has ground for boasting. And the boasting is this, he can spread the gospel free of charge. And being free, not only can more people hear it, but in not demanding compensation or rights, no one can disregard the gospel by saying that he's just like these other traveling preachers and he's only in it for the money. And so it eliminates what could otherwise be an obstacle to the way, in the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, Paul doesn't want anything that he does to get in the way of the gospel. He wants people to clearly see Jesus and the gospel. He wants, to, to get, he wants people to get from him an unobstructed view of the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I mean by an unobstructed view? Last year around this time, Ruthann and I went to Seattle to see the, the Mariners play baseball. And when I was ordering tickets, you could choose between the, the cheaper obstructed view seats and the more expensive unobstructed view seats. 
And in the unobstructed view seats, you couldn't see every square foot of the field. And so there would be sometimes a, you know, something blocking your view. There'd be a foul pole or there'd be a fence or something like that. So you can see in the picture, you know, if you were sitting right there, something's blocking a certain part of the field. But then you had the unobstructed view seats. And those were the ones where you could see clearly and there was nothing blocking your view. Like your eyesight was the only limit to what you could actually see. Well, that's what Paul wants to have. He wants people to have an unobstructed view of the gospel where there is no obstacle that obstructs people from seeing the truth that Jesus came in the flesh, he died for sinners, he rose from the dead, he's alive and working in, his, working in and through his people, and this whole thing is about relationship with Jesus. He knew that if he were to demand his rights, that could become an obstacle, and so he chose instead to sacrifice his rights for the sake of the spread of the good news about Jesus. And not only was the spread of the gospel the reason for his sacrificing his rights, but it was also the reward for him. Because point number three, the rewards for sacrificing rights are people get saved through the gospel. That's what he wants to see. He wants to see lives changed. He wants to see people turn to Christ. And so he has a reason. He wants the gospel to spread, and he has a reward in that. People will come to Jesus. Look again at verse 18. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. So here Paul states clearly the reward that he's after. He, he wants this to, to be a free of charge gospel so that he can win people. And as one who is free, he is free in Christ. He can live whatever way he wants as long as it's not sin. Paul has voluntarily made himself a servant of people. And that's for the reward of winning more people for Christ. How has he done that? He tells us in verse 20. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And so for the Jews that he's worked with, he, he didn't change the message of the gospel, but he changed, his, he changed and adapted his preferences and his methods to be able to win those for Christ who were Jewish and those who were living under the Old Testament traditions of the law. We saw that in Acts chapter 21. Uh, some of the Jewish Christians complain that Paul seemed to be getting a little, little loose on his holiness, a little loose on his observance to the law. And, and so they didn't have to, but Paul and his team, they went through several days of, of Jewish ceremonial purification before they went in the temple to worship, all in order that, that Paul's freedom from the law wasn't used as an obstacle to the gospel. Paul didn't have to do that. His team didn't have to do that. The Bible doesn't require that they do that, but he didn't want his right to not have to do that get in the way of people hearing and receiving the gospel. He adapted his ministry for Gentiles too. Look at verse 21. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. See an example of this in Galatians chapter 2. Uh, Peter had been meeting with these, this group of Jewish uh, Christians who believed that people needed to be circumcised in order to, to be faithful Christians. And, and it had caused Peter to sort of pull away from eating with the Gentile Christians in the church there. And in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, Paul tells us that he opposed Peter. Peter being a, a fellow Jewish Christian, he opposed Peter on this issue and defended the Gentiles. So that Peter's behavior uh, would be an obstacle to the gospel, to people understanding that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel's for Jews and the gospel's for Gentiles. And, and so Paul was willing to adapt his ministry for the sake of the Jews. He was willing to adapt his ministry for the sake of the Gentiles. And he says in verse 22, he was willing to adapt his ministry for the sake of the weak. He says, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. 
Here's Paul. Paul is referring to the people we talked about last week who have weak consciences, who, whose faith could be destroyed by another believer's use of their freedom. And in the case from last week, it was a brother or sister in Christ using their freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And again, Paul had said in chapter 8, verse 13, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. And so you see, Paul was willing to sacrifice his rights for these people. He was really willing to sacrifice what he could claim, his preferences even, so that the gospel would be spread and so that he would have the reward of seeing people saved and, and to grow to know Jesus. And so he concludes in the second part of verse 22. Look at verse 22. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. Now, someone might say, you know, that sounds like hypocrisy. That sounds like hypocrisy, being one way around some people, speaking one way when you're around the Jews, and then speaking a different way when you're around the Gentiles, not being the same person in every environment. That sounds like being a hypocrite. But you see, in this case, that is not hypocrisy. That is love. Hypocrisy would be teaching others to live for Christ and live like Christ and then not living that way yourself when it didn't benefit you or your preferences. That's not what Paul is doing. Paul is calling us to follow his example of consistently being willing to give up our own rights and preferences in order to put the needs of others first. And and you know, that's what foreign missionaries, for example, do all of the time. That's what they do all the time. With the exception of doing things that are sinful, foreign missionaries who go into other cultures, they go in willing to give up traditions and norms and, and practices of their home culture to become like the culture of the people they're ministering to, uh, ministering to so that they can reach people with the gospel. That's a missionary mindset. It's putting our ambitions and desires and personal preferences, preferences aside so that they don't get in the way of people being able to share in the blessings of the gospel by hearing the gospel unobstructed from our rights and preferences. Blessings that would include the joy that comes in fellowshipping together as those who are brothers and sisters in Christ and seeing new people come into the faith. He wants to share those blessings with those new believers, and we should want that as well. You see, this whole chapter is about potentially getting in the way of the gospel. Not allowing our rights and preferences to be an obstacle to people hearing and embracing the the clear message of the good news that what really matters in life is not our rights and preferences. It, It is forgiveness from sin. It is true joy in fellowship with our creator, hope for eternal life with Jesus only through the faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. That must be the most precious thing to us so that we would be willing to make personal sacrifices for that. And so the question for us this morning is this. Does our life show that the gospel is the most precious way, or most precious thing to us? Another way of saying that is this. Which view do people get of the gospel when they look at your life? Is it an unobstructed view where they can see Jesus in the gospel clearly for what it really is? Or do they get an obstructed view of Jesus because the way that you use your freedom or your rights in Christ present obstacles that get in the way of Jesus? What are some of those possible possible obstacles, and, and how do they get there? Well, one way they get there is when we raise our personal preferences about things to a level that is at or near the level of the importance of the gospel, and we insist that faithfulness to Jesus requires faithfulness to our desires and our preferences. And that can happen in a variety of ways. 
It can be insisting that faithfulness to Jesus requires that everyone votes for our preferred candidate or our preferred party. It can be insisting that faithfulness to Jesus requires embracing our lifestyle choices and convictions when those are really areas of personal conscience as long as they're not overt sin. It can be insisting that faithfulness to Jesus requires that people agree with our favorite theological idea or nuanced doctrine when the Bible actually gives us freedom of interpretation. It can be insisting that our way of doing ministry for Jesus is best, and if others don't do it that way, they're wrong. And then we condemn it and we become critical. It can be insisting that faithfulness to Jesus requires that we must sing certain styles of songs in worship or dress a certain way when we come to church. When we demand that people must do things according to our preferences, or we are unwilling to adapt our methods while still holding tightly to the truth of the gospel message to reach people, we can become obstacles to people hearing and understanding the basic truth of the gospel, which is that the Christian life is not about us, and it's not about our rights. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Now, here's one thing about the gospel that makes this so precious to us even this morning. We have likely failed in some of those areas at some point in our lives. And here's why the gospel is so precious. There is forgiveness for that. If you have failed like I have in this area, and the Lord is revealing to you maybe this morning that your life may have become an obstacle to the gospel in the life of someone else or in some way, or maybe the Lord is revealing to you that the gospel hasn't been as precious to you as it should, know this. There is forgiveness because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that is the gospel message. There is forgiveness in Christ. And if you will turn to Jesus for forgiveness and help, he can create a love in you for the good news and stir your heart to want to share the unadulterated, unobstructed view of the gospel so that people see it for what it really is. If you will turn to Jesus... And so turn to Christ. Turn to the good news of forgiveness in Jesus, even as you live your life turning other people, or at least directing other people, to that same gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for what you have done for us. We are so thankful that through your death and resurrection, There is a life that is abundant for us in this life, and there is a hope for eternal life in the future with you. And Lord, we want people to know that. We want people to to hear that. We have seen that, and so we want to be able to be ambassadors for you where other people see that in our lives and in our, our message. And yet, Lord, there are so many things that can become obstacles to people hearing and seeing that in us. And so we would ask, Lord, that you would um, refine us that you would uh, transform us, that you would make us more like Christ in how we understand uh, what you've done for us. We understand the gospel and understand the application of the gospel for our lives so that we would not put obstacles in the way of people seeing what it truly is. Lord, would you help us? Would you take our lives? Would you use them for the sake of, of your purposes in the world so that people can be saved? Lord, may we be like Paul, being willing to... Uh, become like so that others can become like you. Lord, not in sin, that we wouldn't become like in sin, but rather we'd be willing to adapt our methods and adapt the way we reach out to people so that people can actually see you and we would not become an obstacle in that way. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.